not aware of anything that needs to happen. Okay, so our last talk of today and of this workshop is being given by Arno Pauli, um, speaking on the first order and the deterministic part of the Weirach degrees. Arno. Thanks for having me here. Um, sort of, it would have been a great meeting under sort of all kinds of circumstances, but at least I really felt once sort of was here, I really didn't realize how much I needed something like this to happen. So um, thanks to the organizers for making it happen. Thanks to all of you for making it, it happen. Um, it was a very, very great thing. Um, yeah, so my plan is to talk about some operations on viral degrees that have popped up in various places where I've been thinking about things. Um, so some others have, have made observations there, there as well, um, with the basic theme being often when we're looking at viral degrees, we're, we're looking at uh, sort of objects which are very hard to work with because they are multivariate functions between represented spaces or, or bare space. Um, a lot of moving parts, they, they, they are really weird ones out there. Um, and by, under, by instead thinking about simpler objects that still reflect what's going on, we can save ourselves some headaches sometimes. Yeah, the sort of very short overview, um, we've, we've seen it in, in the Damir talks um, yesterday, where reducibility compares multivalued functions between represented spaces. So we just have things which are instances, we have things which are matching solutions. Um, and sort of there is this not really, for, for, for some reason, for example, in the, reverse mass tradition coding just happens but you don't talk about coding computable analysis tradition sort of sometimes you talk about coding a bit too much um but the coding always happens anyway um you, you need the coding to move from boring sequences of numbers to interesting mathematical objects I feel I did something bad uh, right now. I don't know what. Um, well, we, we do have sort of very rich algebraic structure and um, maybe we should stop defining new operations on them at some point. Um, not really for this talk to today, but something that sort of someone should start doing soon is to either prove that we can define some of these operations that we have in terms of other operations or prove that we can't, to at least make, make sure that we have an, a better idea of what's the like minimum signature we need to really be talking about that structure rather than just collecting everything that looks useful and nice and just keep it all. Um, hoarding is a sort of very natural tendency, but you need to get it under control. The sort of typical motivation for, for looking at these uh, things is that we can often view mathematical theorems as sort of telling us for objects like these, there are objects of that nature, and then it, it makes sense to us, okay, can, can I actually compute those, what's going wrong, how difficult is that, is that map, and um, these trans translations essentially tell you something about the computational content of a theorem, which I would be happy to take as a definition rather than a, than a statement, actually. A lot of the algebraic operations that we have sort of have some kind of logic-like meaning. Um, with that, I mean, if you're sort of looking at a paper, oh, here are, you see sort of, here are the structure operations on the viral degrees and maybe you read a book on substructural logics, um, you end up thinking a lot of times, oh, this all looks very similar. And then you look into the details and see, oh no, here it's different now. Um, so have a logic like meaning is um, 
sort of my professional judgment about what the right phrasing for this is having thought about this for a couple of of, of years um, this is not just abbreviating the answer that is the answer um yeah we've classified quite a few things sometimes you can sort of just read what people in reverse mass have done steal it or what people in um con constructive mathematics have done building programming counter examples to sort of show that the theorem can't have a constructive proof um sometimes things really change and you either have to work much harder to get a sort of viral classification or you can ignore a lot of the complications um because for viral reducibility you would typically sort of work with whatever meta theory you're comfortable with on the outside and it's just for the computations where where you need to sort of pay attention to what you're actually doing okay so i'll plan to give a brief definition of what we're talking about then say what is the first order part um give a few examples them first order part just to give the spoiler is, is essentially about what kinds of things can you compute where the answers are just normal natural numbers not entire bare space elements just one number um and the finite part is the same thing except that you even have a bound on where those numbers might be coming from so simple stuff is happening um when we are generally talking about multivariate functions it's a rather natural thing to ask okay just get rid of that multi just do functions functions are easier and the deterministic part is capturing that okay i said at some uh it's for it's comparing multivariate functions on represented spaces represented space is just all well, some stuff we're interested in some way of coding the interesting stuff by um, elements of counter space and then of course you, you you need to make sure that you've picked the representations that you actually wanted um it's 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 really about sort of a notion of a space rather than a set you need to see you need to make sure that say if you want to work with the space of real numbers that has more structure than just being a set um, well and once you know how you code elements you sort of know how to do computations computations act on counter space interesting stuff is happening between the represented spaces um, the notion of a realizer of a map between represented spaces is just something that takes um, names for inputs and maps them to some name for some matching output and here, here already we, we see that it's rather natural that multivariate functions are the sort of first class citizens here. Um, because since in most interesting represented spaces, elements have multiple names. If you just take a function on counter space, um, it will sort of realize a multivariate function on represented spaces that it has absolutely no reason to map. Um, different names for the same object to names for the two names for the same object in the um go to the domain space and most of the time enforcing any kind of extensionality is is not what you should be doing it would be computable for maps on represented spaces just means having a computable realizer continue the same thing and we could extends that to whatever nice class of functions on, on, on counter space you may have. And um, yeah, the, the sort of notion of viral reducibility had precursors around for, for a while. Um, to the best of my knowledge, the first correct definition is actually, uh, was given by Guido Gerardi and Alberto Marcone in uh, 28. And um, the, the idea is just, well, a viral reduction um, of a map F to a, a, a map D is a computable procedure that will ask exactly one question to, to some oracle for, for to, to, to some oracle for, for G and from, from, from that compute whatever F should answer. So 
k here is something computable, h here is something computable. This is a magic black box, just taking in queries to G and outputting answers, which we use once, so the entire thing moves from, from left to right here. Damir mentioned that we get a distributive letters here. Um, that's nice. And oh, when, whenever you're sort of taking, having a, a, a distributive lattice, you can start getting ideas over, oh, let's, you, let's interpret this lattice as a collection of truth values with your lattice operations giving you end. And or if your lattice were complete, you can then go and define all kinds of other things, just the supremer and infima of QT. That would make you like it. Um, and that really doesn't work here because whenever you have an infinite collection of hierarchy degrees, the supremum of that exists, if and only if it is already the supremum of a finite subset. Um, whenever you have a strictly ascending chain, there isn't the least upper, upper bound, essentially because. Um, there's no sort of generic proper numbering of, of all of those, and um, you can build things that are obviously on top, but um, just pre prevents the sort of index choice of what goes goes where. You do. Infima sometimes work, but not not but not all of them. Um, but most of the day, the time you actually want want. Supremum, and this just means that rather than just writing down the supremum that you want, you actually have to construct whatever one element is in that in that task. One of those things that um, that would have worked, it would have been nice for the logic idea. We did have arbitrary supremum, is that we could have defined an implication that would have turned it into a shading. I algebra, but that kind of set actually doesn't have a, a supremum, so it's not a hating algebra. I will be talking about a few examples. One of that is lim. Um, we get as input a convergent sequence in bare space, where we really just are promised that it's going to be con 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 converging. We, we don't know anything about that. Output is whatever it is. Con Con converging to that's just as hard as computing the um, jump viewed as a function from counter space to, to counter space where you actually kind of output the relative halting problem. And with this idea is that we're looking at sort of something analogous to re re reverse mass here, doing limb or doing sort of compositions of limb with, 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 um, with itself. That's that's just ACA because well ACA is doing 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 jumps and um, a sort of very familiar way sort of how we are getting benchmark principles in the in the viral degree stuff we can compare things to that we understand well are the close choice principles. Um, Formally, we we fix a represented space. We have a notion of what is the represented space of closed subsets of that, and then we can look at the the multivalued map that takes in a non-empty closed set and outputs some element of it. A closed set is essentially sort of a generic way of determining that points are not in it. So, closed choice for a space means. If I tell you what, I do, what elements of X I don't want, and I promise you there is something I am happy with, get me one of those nice things. And for, well, for every sort of, for, for non-trivial spaces, you, you can't ever do that um, because there is no speed requirement on that. We're taking these sort of discrete two-point space. Zero is a valid answer, one is a valid answer. Um, I'm going to pretend that everything is fine with me. Um, I wait until you tell me which of zero or one we're going to do, and then saying, "Oh no, that I didn't want. I wanted the other one." That's my choice. On two, doesn't that, that doesn't work? And um, 
if we are say going to choice on bare space, this way of providing the information about what is wrong is essentially um, providing an accountably branching trees. You pass through that tree are the things which are, which are fine. Whenever you put a leaf in your tree, you, you set all of that stuff is just, it's just bad. The question of what corresponds to ATR in Vyrock degrees is the sort of that's one with which has a genuinely long answer, but um, close choice on bare space is roughly in the right spot. And that, that's all that we want to do for, for now. Okay, so first order part. Why are we starting with this whole thing? Because multivariate functions on bare space are weird. Um, and th this is one of those things, you start working on them and you see, oh, you, you, can, you can actually say a lot about things, you feel you understand them better. And at, and at some point um, you go through this initial illusion of understanding things and you see, oh, um, now I'm starting to, to see how, how weird things can be. Damir, Reed and uh, Kater had this idea, well, maybe we can just look at things that output numbers, one number. So that's what's it, what's it called to be the first order part. I believe their motivations came a lot from basically wanting to understand first order consequences of principles in reverse mass. Um, I don't think they are done writing the paper yet, so I don't know the, the details, but it's just a so nice notion that once I knew that they were thinking about it, I couldn't help myself and was, was thinking about it as well. So what we are doing here is we are picking any of the degree F, and now we are defining its first order part to be the maximal Weyroch degree below it, um, where we can just make the co-domain to be numbers. And this is something that sort of that you can 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 actually build in a bit of a brute force way um, by saying, okay, the first order part of F takes in an input for F plus the code for a functional I would be running on the output of F on that, that returns a number. And that way you get numbers and you, you get everything that you could get by numbers just by sort of fitting in what, whatever um, witness for the viral of production here you, you would be using and so on. Yeah, so it's a, it's a real thing. We have that. There's a well-defined first order part of every, every viral of the degree. Sort of it's, it's one of those things where once you know what you're looking for, you realize that you've seen it a, a long time ago. So for example, the results that the first order part of LIM is actually just finding an element in a closed set um, of, the, of the natural numbers that is already in the dissertation of a, of a student of Klaus Weyroch um, from quite a while ago, also predating the proper definition of Weyroch reducibility, but it was all there already. Okay, now, well, this is sort of choice on the natural numbers. Well, there, there it's just that, okay, potential answers are some natural number and I'm allowed to, to say at, at any moment, I've now decided that this number is a bad number. Now I don't want to see it. I can't say that I don't want to see any numbers. One number needs to stay there. And then the, the output is one of those numbers I've never said I don't want. ACCN is the sort of weakening of that where I can only disallow one number. So the sort of input to, um, and one way of coding that is saying, okay, um, it's actually defined on, on all of bare space. If my input is just constant zero, I never rule out any kind of number. Any number is a perfectly fine answer. Um, and if I ever, or I can say at some point, n is the wrong answer. n is the one number out of all the infinitely many numbers that I do not want to see. And after I've, I've said that, I have to accept everything else. So it's, it's really weak principle, but it's sort of clearly not continuous. Because if you wanted to solve it, you would need to at some point tell me a number if I haven't said anything about bad numbers yet. And after that, I can say whatever number I got and, and thereby make it wrong. 
And it's actually a sort of very weak principle for a, for a good reason. Um, ongoing joint work with Giovanni Solda, um, being Weiroch above this, this principle up to some oracle. So this is a con continuous Weiroch, Weiroch reduction that we have here. Um, is the very same thing as having any kind of discontinuous first order part whatsoever. So that's the weakest discontinuous principle that outputs numbers. And this is also equivalent to basically being sequentially discontinuous, which is one of those parts where we're really the intuition we have for functions and the intuition sort of and how multivalued functions work just differ quite a bit. Often one of these sort of first notions of what continuity means is that, well, if you've got a function, if you've got a sequence in your domain converging to some point, the function values should be converging to the function value of the limit. Um, but saying that you've got a discontinuity at, at all on any kind of converging sequence in your domain just happens to be the very same thing as being able to compute a discontinuous multivalued function into the natural number. Um, so, I mean, we can alternatively just say, okay, you can be this, you can compute something which is discontinuous with full domain n. It's the same thing as being able to compute something which is discontinuous with domain just the sort of standard kind of bendings in rank one space. And we have, we, we are in the process of, of looking into generalizing this sort of kind of bendings in rank alpha. Seems to be working out. Um, I have no intuition for why this should be true. <laughs> Seems a bit um, weird. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's essentially here, just a re restatement of that. So um, sort of there, the sort of first order part really captures a particular way of why stuff might be just continuous. Stop knocking off the microphone. So, well, if this idea of something being discontinuous without being discontinuous on any conversion sequence seems weird to you, I will now tell you something weirder, which will make more sense. Um, if we're looking at the multivalued function, that's just taking in an input and everything which is a valid output is stuff which don't during compute your input. So this one is just asserting for every, um, element of, of bare space, there exists an element of bare space that doesn't do Turing compute it. And uh, sorry, that's, that's, that's not Turing co computer byte. So non-computable things exist without any reason why they would. Well, if you're restricting this to any subset of, of its domain whose cardinality is less than the continuum, well, then if you've got less than continuously many things, you close and downwards on a Turing radius ability, it's still less than continuum simply many things. So it's not co-final in the Turing degrees. There's a Turing degree, which is not um, computed by any of them, which means that you can solve this non-computability problem on any sufficiently small subset of its domain by a constant function. It's discontinuous, but only on huge sets, not on not huge sets. And that makes probably might make more sense to you than the, than, than, the, than the previous thing. So yes, this continuity might just happen in the big picture, but not anywhere locally. How do we get these kinds of things? Well, we are getting them by looking at a kind of game. It's basically just sort of variation of these sort of usual rage games. You've got two players taking turns. Player one always plays some natural number. Player two can also play a number or, or skip. It goes on for omega many, many rounds. Player one is supposed to play a name for an element of the space X. If player one fails to do that in the limit, player one has lost, game is over. If player one isn't losing for that reason, um, player two might be losing because um, he skips too much. He is supposed to be actually playing numbers 
in infinite, infinitely many times and the numbers he is playing should form a name for some element in, 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 in why? And pro provided that both players have done what they are supposed to do, we can then ask, is what player two played a valid output for the function we are we're parameterizing the whole thing with for what, what, what player one played? And well, a winning strategy for, for player two is a continuous realizer for this multivariate function. Um, so player two winning this, this game and the multivariate function f being continuous, that's, that's just the, the very same thing. Okay, so how are we using this? Well, we want to invoke the, 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 the determinacy and do something with winning strategies of the, the, the first player. And for that, we need this not map. Um, we're using the completion that was in the, the, the Damir's talks yesterday. Essentially, the idea is we take everything which, in, in, including partial counter space elements that fail to de, be a name for an X element. And now they are all they are all elements for a new thing called bottom that we've added. We've just sort of made the representation very total in the most brute force way possible. And now this not x thingy is taking something in this completion for x. If you actually got bottom, do whatever you want, just output something inside x. If you got something from x, output something else. And the winning strategy for, for player one um, is, sort of, is a reduction of this not, not map for the codomain space to F. He's, he's looking at what might be the, the thing player two is playing. Could be just a partial object, could be an actual name. If it is, if it is some name, he needs to play something that F would map to something else. And sort of let's go look at that for the for the sort of reason that you get a sort of minimal continuous viral degree above the continuous ones if you use AD. That means that all these games are de de determined, and then this is this not map for 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 bare space. That's the sort of weakest discontinuous thing. It's in particular the sort of weakest thing, which is discontinuous for a reason you can comprehend. Questions there are okay. Um, what is the strength of saying all these games are de 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 determined? Um, if we pick a particular space Y, which is sort of less rich than bare space, what's happening then? So, for example, part of how Giovanni and I proved the theorem earlier is that we well, that. If your codomain space is just some number, which means player two skips as often as player two wants. At some point, player two says, this is the number I'm, I'm playing. And after that, it doesn't matter what, what player two does anymore. That game is determined for a good reason. So the not map on for n, which is ACCN, is just below this. It also works for Sapinski space. Um, I haven't looked at other sort of reasonable candidates yet. Slight detour, because I'm already realizing that I will not get to, to the end of my, my talk anyway. Um, if we, for example, looking at problems that return truth values, so these sort of, I mean, we have the, the Booleans as truth values, where sort of you have just, it's either yes or no, I'm going to tell you. The Pinsky space is the sort of next complicated truth value thingy where every constant zero sequence count, uh, codes false, everything else calls, codes true. So you know if something is true, but falsity is just the absence or um, stuff being, or stuff, that, that stuff is not true. Now, the not map for Sipinski space is actually just the negation on Sipinski space where you need to sort of swap true and false. Um, and that's true for all of the higher level truth value spaces that we could be looking at. And that has just the variety of LPO. 
in particular, sort of maps into Sapinski space are actually discontinuous for very sequentially discontinuous reasons, um, as opposed to sort of multivalued maps into simpler spaces. So like, I don't know what, why that happened. Um, we could also do say sigma zero two truth values where everything that has finitely many ones is true, everything else is false. Um, we again get that negation on that is the least discontinuous map that returns a sigma zero two. Truth value, um, I can tell you sort of below what part of the usual viral degree benchmark that is. Um, but it doesn't compute anything with numbers. And if I would attach this here somehow, I would maybe knock it off less often. Okay, but I do have a little bit left. So I shall say a few things about nice examples. Um, the first order part was the sort of most complicated thing that is returning a natural number. The finite part is saying, okay, you, you're first specifying some number k, and now you, you, you want to do something that is going to be returning an answer 0, 1, 2, up to k, k, k minus 1. So we have the, the, the join over all k here, and then once k is fixed, we're taking the largest thing below f with codomain k. This is something we can build essentially in the, in the very same idea how we build all of those things. Okay, so why, why would we be looking at this? And um, of one situation where it turned out to be, be relevant, which actually inspired me to pro, 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 propose this, um, is the joint uh, project with Vittorio. He is maybe C as well, yeah, um, hidden. Um, so we've been looking at sort of various questions on finding subgraphs of countable graphs and so on. And one problem is that that turned out to be a bit weird is um, you have a connected countable per graph. I'm promising you that there's a kind of copy of a line in there. The goal is find a copy of that line. Now, this is, rather clearly below this, 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 this CTN principle, you can define the countable branching tree such that every path is a line in that and so on. And you might think that the other way works as well, right? Just take, um, sort of take a countable branching tree. If it's ill-founded, it, it has a line, feed it into that, you get a copy of the line. That, that's the path, right? Well, the line can go up a little bit and then down. Um, and if you sort of, if, if you only care about Turing de degrees, then the fact that you're going up finitely many steps before you're going down doesn't matter. Um, if you would, if you would get an embedding of the standard line into your graph, you would be able to tell that you're going up and wait until you start going down and then find that pass. But if you only get the subgraph and the promise, oh yes, it's, certain, it's certainly going to be um, a line. But if you, you, you don't see whether you're going up, you can see maybe I've seen a few things, but that could all be on the wrong part and it's actually going down here. Maybe you've actually seen it turning around and you, you just don't know which end is the finite end, which end, end is the infinite end. So there's sort of some non-uniformity here. Well, and if you, if you can, can just compute the limit of a of convergent sequence in the space zero one, after finding you, that line, you can use that to sort of figure out which one is the infinite part, you, you get your path, everything is fine. So a little bit extra help, this principle can do a lot. Take just the line and try to answer anything with a sort of in a, in a discrete range, in a, in a, in a finite range, you can't do non-computable things. So the sort of strengths of this principle is really hidden, hidden well. You need this extra limit to, 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 to get at it. It can do this ACCN thing. So if you have infinitely many things, you can um, rule out one of them. Um, 
we don't have these sort of precise first order part here, but this is this is sort of showing. I mean, by knowing that the finite part of this principle is, is so weak, we essentially Im immediately know that it's not computing anything we have in the sort of standard viral zoo because usual things don't have trivial finite part. Um, it's with the sort of viral zoos here, it is just elsewhere. It's be only below something very high. It is not below anything else, but it also isn't above any, anything else. It's just off to the, to the side. And, and, and that's usually why we, why we end up looking at this. Another example um, is uh, from, from stuff with Shunli and Manlius, somewhat similar flavor. We're now looking at a linear order, which has infinite descending sequences, and we want one. Um, again, it's sort of not too different from finding a pass. And by, by sort of using the um, Brouwer ordering on the vertices of the tree, you can make sure that every descending sequence gives you something that is converging to a pass. But there is this limit that shows up. You, you can't extract the um, pass from what's happening in, in the linear order. Um, and if you're trying to answer anything with answers in a, in a, in a finite range um, by getting yourself descending sequences through arbitrary linear orders that have one, you could have just used the pigeonhole principle. Pigeonhole principle can do everything with finite range or use that that this other principle can do. So again, we have this um, thing which is sort of clearly very hard to solve because if you had a little bit more, you would get very far up. Um, but it's, it's, it's rather weak in terms of what it, what it can do just on its own. I'll actually do tell you what the deterministic part is. Um, similar idea is before we are looking at the maximal Virog degree below a given Virog degree that has a nice representative, um, we can define this for any represented space X that we're saying I want the largest Virog degree below me, which can compute a function, a single valued function. Into this, it's that space X, we've mostly looked at it just for bare space. Um, and well, it's, it's basically sort of folklore that WKL doesn't do unique things for you that you couldn't have gotten without WKL. One way of formalizing that is, well, if you're first doing, doing some F, whatever F is, and then you're doing WKL, and the total thing computes a function for you, just forget about the WKL part. It was useless for this purpose. You could have gotten around it. Um, this is sort of, sort of, I'm sure that there's sort of a theorem of which both the, this one and um, what we heard, uh, what Dan mentioned, that, that basically descending sequences in linear orders don't uniformly compute anything better than zero jump. Here we are asking what kind of functions can we get from descending sequences? We can do, do, do we can co compute one limit. We can't get anything more powerful that is a function. Um, and yeah, I'm actually going to be talking about that as well. So this is uh, with <laughs> Takeyuki Kahara and Alberto Makona. We looked at sort of stuff related to the perfect set principle. And one thing that you may end up looking at, at there is if you have a countable closed set, so you've got a, here we're working in, in, in counter space, you have a binary tree, you know that there are countably many passes through that tree, I've just promised you. Now the goal is list all of the passes in it, in whatever order, I don't care. You, you just have to, to list the passes that, that go in there. Well, if you do it three times in a row, so you give me a tree, I tell you a listing of all of those passes, you give me a tree based on whatever I just told you, 
I list all of the paths. So if, if, if we do that three times, um, we can do the very same thing as taking a countably branching tree with a single infinite pass, and we want to get, get that, which is just saying, I want, sort of, I, I want to be able to specify any kind of hyper arithmetic thing and, and get that with three times we can do it. And that's obviously a, a, a function if you want the, the unique infinite path through countably branching tree. If you only do it once and you want to do a function with it, well, you can do one limit. You can't do more than one limit at a time. The weirdest thing for me here is, is the whole thing about doing it three times. I don't know whether doing it twice would be good enough. Um, doing it once obviously can't be. Doing it three times works. Um, don't know too, but do. And final example, and then I should stop. Um, so the examples so far were always used to, to, to actually basically describe where is this viral de degrees that we are looking at by giving an answer of the form, it's elsewhere. It's off to the side. It's not there where we like to look around. In this e example here, I don't know anything that strong, but it just turned out that looking at the deterministic part was how we could prove a separation that we had difficulty with. This is a uh, from Ramsey's dial principle. We are taking the, we, we are we, we're taking the, we, we, we are taking Q, we are coloring it with K, K, K colors. You know, clearly some color must be dense on some interval. Um, and we want a color which is dense on some interval. We don't, we, we aren't going to be told where the interval is, we just get the color. Well, um, you can do the pigeonhole principle with it. Um, basically, you're, you're just sort of uniformly spreading out the, the colors yes, that you see in a, in a kind of sequence of colors, spread them out over all of the rational numbers, and then you can make sure that colors that you see infinitely often are dense somewhere, find that these many colors are not dense. If you're allowed to ask finitely many questions of the form, does the sequence have infinitely many ones? Yes, no. You, you can basically ask, okay, is this combination of colors exactly what is dense on some interval and so on? You can, you can do it thereby. Um, I'm not aware of any sort of good benchmark principles in between here. So we, we didn't really have anything else to com compare it to, but ultimately we, we were able to prove that the is that this disc that's this sort of deterministic yes no style questions are, are not necessary to, to solve this. Um, because actually, whenever you're computing a function by getting those, those colors. So if you're, if you're somehow making sure that no matter which of the various colors which are dense in your coloring you're, you're, you're getting, you're ultimately answering, returning the, the same kind of answer, you could have instead just created a coloring which is eventually constant and then ask for well, what is the color which is constant in the end. And I think at that point, I should stop. And thank you very much. Hey, do we have questions? I see one. Hold on. If Jun Lei go. Thanks, Arno. Uh, possibly a stupid question, but deterministic part of finite part, is it the same as finite part of deterministic part? You know, things like do these things play well with each other? Um, well, see. I sort of, I've written down the definition of the finite part for the first time Tuesday evening. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know yet. Okay, cool. All right. Well, if you figure it out, maybe you should go into paper. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so um, you actually say something in response. Um, we've sort of, you can, of course, nest these, these things. And if you are saying, okay, what kinds of things can you compute from a what what kind of things with natural number outputs can you compute from a function which you can compute from a variety of degree f 
that's the same thing as just wanting to compute a function that is going to give you numbers, which you can compute from f. If you first compute numbers, if you sort of first go to stuff that, that's just getting your numbers, and then you want a function which is built below that, we don't know whether that's, that might actually be more powerful. And this is ultimately asking if you can cover the domain of a multivariate function by, by kind of countably many things, such that every restriction is of the, fun of the multivariate function to a piece becomes computable. Is there a way to get a partition of the same complexity that still works? Shouldn't be hard, but yeah, um, we gave up. Or at least I gave up. I don't want to speak for my courses here. Okay, anything more questions? Trying to keep an eye on the chat here as well. Don't see anything there. Online people are welcome to speak up. Uh, Maria? Yeah, I have a, a question that will expose my limited knowledge of lattice theory and the viral lattice in particular. But why do these maximums that are used to define the first order part and um, the, the other, the finite part, why do they exist? Because you're taking a maximum over some infinite set. Yeah. Right, so I mean, basically what I, what I was saying earlier about what, what we couldn't do is we, we couldn't just write soup here and be happy with it. So that wouldn't be defining a viral degree in any meaningful full way. But it's actually a maximum, so there is, there's one thing in there which, which works. So the, the supremum of the infinite set is equal to the supremum of a single element in it. Um, and just and sort of you're, you're, you're always building these um, sort of in, in the viral reduction of, of any such G to F, well, you have the sort of functional that's witnessing how you turn the answer that you got from F into whatever G should do. These are partial cont continuous functions, so they have codes. So you can specify in advance what you're planning to, to do. And here we, we, we're just saying, okay, yeah, you're specifying in advance what you want to do to F to actually get your, your output, but you're only allowed to specify functionals that no matter what else happens, extensionality is preserved. That's of course sort of I, the domain of that can be horrible because who, who knows what functionals are valid inputs and what functionals are, are not valid inputs. But you force it to be a function, it's obviously below f, so it's fine. And every other function, which is reducible to f, so just look at whatever you did in that reduction and taking the name for whatever you were planning to do later and feeding it into the input for the thing we construct for the maximum witnesses that you are below that. Okay, any more questions? We don't, don't see anything here. So first order of business, let us thank Arno again. Thank <laughs> you.